Hello and welcome to AP Comparative Government. Today I'm going to be talking about the Russian Federation. Before we begin, just a couple of words about the Russian Federation. Russia is, to an extent, somewhat of a problematic country to discuss right now, mostly because of the war in Ukraine and because of repeated changes to the Russian Constitution. That being said, I'm going to try to cover the parts of Russia that a College Board will expect individuals to know for the purposes of taking the AP test. And we have to begin with the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. So the Cold War effectively ends in 1991, and the Soviet Union collapses and breaks apart. Boris Yeltsin then becomes the first president of the Russian Federation, the non-Soviet idea that Russia could be its own country. He instituted what's called shock therapy. Shock therapy were major reforms that were intended to push the state toward democracy and free market economics. Some of them worked, some of them did not. Unfortunately, Boris Yeltsin was a relatively weak president. He was often dominated by family members and close advisors. Also hampering his ability to effectively govern, Boris Yeltsin is a confirmed severe alcoholic and died of alcoholism. A new Russian constitution, however, was put in place during his rule in 1993. But if you're going to know a name that has to do with Russia, that name is Vladimir Putin. Russia and Russian politics, at least at present, is essentially synonymous with Putin. He was first elected president in 2000 and then again in 2004. He stepped down in the 2008 election per the Russian constitution which limited the number of presidential terms that could be served to two consecutive. However, Putin stayed on as prime minister. We'll talk about this in a second. The Russian Federation is a semi-presidential system, so it has elements of a parliamentary system and a presidential system. The new prime minister was Dmitry Medvedev. However, Putin was the one who was pulling the strings as the prime minister. Then in 2012 and 2018, Putin returned to the presidency, successfully winning both campaigns. In 2022, Putin had the Russian constitution changed, and it was changed so that he could run again. So under the current terms of the constitution, the presidency is now one term, and that term is for six years. Hence, the next election would be in 2028. There is no way of knowing at this point if Putin intends on honoring that self-imposed term limit that he put into place. Recently, there's been speculation about his health. He is getting older, and so there's major concerns about whether or not he will even be physically able to run when the next election comes up. Please keep in mind that Russia is a hybrid regime. That is, that on its surface, it has what appears to be democratic institutions but it is classified as an authoritarian regime. So those democratic institutions are by and large just a smokescreen. If we look at power and authority in Russia, we have to start with the historical influences that have been so important in developing the idea of both authority in Russia and legitimacy. Historically, Russia has always been under some form of authoritarian government. Under the Tsar, who was the ruler of Russia up until 1917 and had been for centuries, we had absolute rule. The Tsar had 100% authority to do whatever the Tsar wanted to do. After the collapse of Tsarist Russia in 1917 and the Russian Revolution, we had a brief period of Marxist-Leninism, which was still authoritarian. And then under Joseph Stalin, the state shifted to a much more totalitarian government where virtually every aspect of its citizens' lives were controlled by the Russian government, in this case, the Soviet government. The one exception to this rule is the brief period of rule by Boris Yeltsin, who was a democratically elected president, a constitutionally elected president. However, under Vladimir Putin, Russia has slipped back into authoritarianism. It is also important to notice that Russia has extensive cultural heter heteronegity, so that's compared to homogeneity, right? 
So it's not uniform. It's very distinct. There are distinct cultural groups, mostly on the peripheries of Russia. If you look at a map, and we'll look at one in just a second, Russia is a very large place. Ukraine is a great example of this. There are a lot of ethnic Russians who live in the eastern portions of Ukraine, but very few in the West. So claims that Ukraine is ethnically Russian are by and large false. That being said, there's always this question of which way will Russia continue to face politically, east or west? Will it turn inward or will it turn towards the west? The last thing to keep in mind when we talk about Russia's power and authority is that Russia experienced the two biggest revolutions of the 20th century, first in 1917 and then in 1991, and the shock waves of those revolutions continue to be felt today. Talking about the political culture of Russia, there's just a couple of things to note. First, geography. Russia is huge. It's the biggest state in the world, um, and a lot of it is not heavily populated. Most of Russians live in the European side, in the regions around St. Petersburg, Moscow, and really from Moscow west until you run into some of the Western countries. There is a lot of ethnic diversity in Russia, but it, again, it tends to be more on the peripheries, in the Caucasus Mountain regions, in the south, along some of the stands, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, so on and so forth. The other factor to know when it comes to political culture is Eastern Orthodoxy. That's the primary religion of those who live in Russia today. It's opposed to sort of Catholicism. So you have the Catholic Church, which at one point was ruled by Rome, and then you have the Eastern Orthodox Church, which starts in Constantinople and then actually migrates more to Moscow after the fall of Constantinople to the Turks in 1453. Eastern Orthodoxy and religion in general was banned during the Soviet Union, which was officially an atheist state. That being said, many Russians today still um, associate themselves with the Eastern Orthodox religion, and it's important to know that that can be a very cohesive um, system. The other thing to know is we have two like sort of dichotomies with Russia. Number one, because of the level of corruption that took place during the Soviet Union, there's a certain skepticism about power and whether power is going to be used for the benefit of the people. That being said, Russia is fiercely nationalistic, and a lot of that has to do with its history. We can't forget that Russia was invaded not once, but twice during the 20th century, both times by Germany. And Russia lost more people in the Second World War than any other country. And that reality tends to cast this long shadow over Russia and still makes it a fiercely nationalistic country. And we see that oftentimes crop up when we start to talk about the relationship between the West and Russia. Many Russians still view the West and the United States and NATO as enemies. And that us versus them mentality can act very much as a source of legitimacy for whatever authoritarian government happens to be in place at the time. Now, there are social cleavages in Russia. One is nationality, ethnicity. 80% of Russia is ethnic Russians, but there are significant minority populations. Chechnya is a great example. Chechnya is right down by Georgia. You can actually see the map that I posted up there. It's primarily Muslim, and there have been major episodes of violence, and Chechnya has attempted to break away. There's actually been efforts at devolution in Chechnya, military devolution, and there's still violence there today. Religion is also a major social cleavage. As I mentioned before, the USSR repressed the Orthodox Church. And then it came back, though, after the Russian second Russian Revolution in 1991. Now, unfortunately, after 2007, the government has taken an increasing control over the church. And today, many Russians question its legitimacy. Is it actually um, its own independent entity or is it just a part of the Kremlin's apparatus of control?
Plus, we can't forget that Muslims in Russia are on the rise, and there may be as many of, as 20 million of them today. They tend to live in one of three areas, which only increases a religious cleavage. And those three areas are Moscow, the Caucasus, and then two regions, Bashkoristan and Tartistan. Another social cleavage, and these two are kind of tied together, social class and rural versus urban. Social class is really a holdover from communism. During the communist period of the Soviet Union, only about 7% of the population were party members, but they got all the perks. And so you have this really divisive social cleavage of the haves and the have-nots, because even still today, the Russian economy is dominated by a group of oligarchs who by and large can trace their success back to Soviet party membership prior to 1991. And in fact, they dominate the government nowadays. Um, the last one is rural versus urban. I would say that this is probably the least important when it comes to Russia. This is essentially an economic cleavage, by the way. About 73% of Russia is urban. It's much better educated, does much better economically. And oftentimes you see parts of rural Russia as a result being a little, you know, I guess you would say angry at that situation. They tend to be a little bit less or a little bit less trustful of the government. Um, they may not see the government as serving their needs, but they're also, as I mentioned, tend to be much more Eastern Orthodox and they tend to be much more nationalistic as a result. And so you, you, you have seen some local parties kind of crop up from now and then during the Russian Federation's life. And a lot of those local parties tend to be in the more urban areas of the government. If we talk about the political beliefs of Russia for just a second and the ideologies that are expressed, um, there is, and it's, again, I know it's, these, these don't tend to go together. And so we have to kind of take off our Western hats as we're looking at Russia, because there's a, a mistrust of government, but also statism, and those two don't go together, but I'll, let me talk about them for a second. An enduring legacy of Marxism is a mistrust of the government. You do have to remember, Russian citizens were promised for decades that communism was better than a free market capitalist economy, that communism was better than democracy, and that communism was triumph. And then guess what? It didn't. Corruption was also rampant throughout the Soviet period. As a result, people don't really trust their government. Yet, paradoxically, Putin has enjoyed tremendous support during his first two terms. And then ironically, Russians are also statists, which means that they expect the state to be intimately involved in their lives. So on the one hand, they don't necessarily trust the government, but they expect the government to do a lot for them. A lot of this is historical. During the period of the Soviet Union, the government was very involved in the lives of the people. And many Russians still expect the same government to do a lot for them. The other two are a little bit less important. In terms of economics, there is still very much an ideological divide in Russia between those who do want to move quickly towards a free market economy, get closer to the West, and those who still very much maybe benefited from the old Soviet system and want to go back to the old Soviet system, or at least want to keep parts of the Soviet system in place. And, and that back and forth dichotomy can create tensions in Russia from time to time. And the last part is just the West. Russia has tended for a long time to identify itself as an antagonistic attitude towards the West. It tends to turn increasingly in recent years towards states like North Korea, China, um, and away from whatever state at that moment happens to be associated with the United States. These attitudes have only increased after the invasion of Ukraine, which I won't talk much about here. And the reason for that is because much of it has happened in the last calendar year, year and a half, and that won't be discussed on, on this year's AP comparative government test. You know, interestingly enough, um, Russian voting patterns, you can interestingly see after the collapse of the Soviet Union, about 75% of Russians participated in that first election. But then after the constitution was put in place in 1993, it dropped dramatically down to 50%. And we've struggled to get 
back up to that level, which is an indication that many Russians may not see the voting process as legitimate or purposeful. If you'd like a number that to do sort of a comparison to the United States, voter turnout in the 2020 election was 67%. Um, so about on par with the Russian election in 2011, but pretty short of what they got in 1991. The Russian constitution is complicated, and I'm really only going to gloss over it because at the end of the day, what matters right now in Russia is what Vladimir Putin wants to do. And so this constitution is there, but again, remember this is a hybrid regime that has democratic veneer, but is authoritarian. So the Russian constitution is federal. It divides power between the central government coming out of the Kremlin in Moscow and regions. These geographic regions, there's 89 of them throughout Russia and 21 are not Russian ethnically. Each region is, this is weird, but technically autonomous and is bound to the central government by a treaty. Note Chechnya has actually not signed the treaty. This doesn't really mean anything um, in terms of practicality, but it is what's in the constitution. Some regions are much more powerful than others. Regions around St. Petersburg have a lot more political power than regions in Siberia, far to the east. This is actually a concept called asymptomatic federalism. Asymptomatic federalism. So it's asymmetrical, not symmetrical. If two things are symmetrical, then they're the same. They're equal. If they're asymmetrical, then they're different. So different regions have different amounts of power. Now look. Putin has made a lot of changes to the constitution, and we need to remember that Russia is an authoritarian state. The real power lies with Putin and his close oligarchic allies. But some of the most important changes he put in place are as follows. One, he created seven super districts in 2000. These districts cover all of Russia and their governors report directly to the president. Two, he changed the constitution so the president could remove said governors from the post whenever he wanted to. Three, he changed the constitution so that these regional governors are now directly appointed by the president, whereas formerly before 2004, these were elected positions. Then in 2007, Putin changed the constitution again. He eliminated single member districts and he made every district proportional. What this did was eliminate the capacity of many of the rural districts to support local regional pop politicians. So. The communist or the former communist party was able to dominate much more easily in that way. But look, the name of the game when it comes to, to Russia is centralized power, centralized in the Kremlin, centralized in Moscow, centralized in the person of Vladimir Putin. We can talk about the constitution all we want to, but the reality is Russia goes the direction that Vladimir Putin wants it to go. Russia is very big in practicing state corporatism. In state corporatism, the state determines which groups have policymaking input. And generally, these corporatist groups in Russia are companies. And these are companies that are quasi-public, quasi-private partnerships. And they're run by men loyal to, I bet you can guess what I'm going to say, Vladimir Putin. The other thing to keep in mind is that the Russian mafia remains extremely active in the state of Russia and has so since the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991. And the Russian mafia has now and again been tied to the government in different ways. Now, when we talk about freedom of speech in Russia, there, there really isn't one. Um, Pravda was the largest media organization in Russia. It gained a lot of traction after 1991 when restrictions were lifted. But since Putin has taken control, he's been able to control not only this media outlet, but almost all media outlets. So today, Pravda is actually much more of a tabloid than a serious newspaper. Other media organizations in Russia have been intimidated or outright threatened by Putin into compliance. Let me give you one example. There's a newspaper called Novaya Gaitsa. And it used to, in the past, be very critical of the government. But it hasn't anymore. Well, why hasn't it? Well, since Vladimir Putin came to power in 2000, five of its most important employees have mysteriously died. 
maybe not so mysteriously died, depending upon who you talk to. Now, as I mentioned, under the 1993 Constitution, we have what's called the semi-presidential system. This has elements of both presidential and parliamentary system, hence semi-presidential. Unfortunately, in the recent years, whichever position has more power, the president or the prime minister, has everything to do with which position Vladimir Putin currently holds. When Medvedev was president in 2008, Putin was prime minister, which is supposed to be a subordinate position. However, he was... at least in theory, the president has the following powers. He has to appoint the prime minister in the cabinet. And then within his cabinet, the president in Russia actually has the capability to issue decrees that have the force of law. Obviously, this system has a tremendous amount of centralized power. The president also has the authority to dissolve the legislative branch, which in Russia is called the Duma. Yep, that's right. The Russian executive branch can dissolve the legislative branch, giving it essentially all the authority. Um, so we'll, I'll talk for just a second about the Russian legislature, but at the outset, please understand that right now, the Russian legislature has been for many years, nothing but a rubber stamp. Um, for anything that Putin has wanted to do. There has not, there's not really been hardly any pushback from either of the two branches. There are two, the Duma and the Federal Federation Council. And um, this is a little bit different. The Duma is much, much larger. It's supposed to be the sort of powerful branch here. It's supposed to pass the laws and legislations and so on and so forth, which it does. Though, frankly, all it does is pass legislation that is proposed by the president, Vladimir Putin, or when he's prime minister. The Federation Council doesn't really have any real power and frankly has been nothing more than a conduit for Putin and his allies to provide support for the things that they want to do because it can be overridden by the Duma. The Russian Federation Council doesn't have a great deal of power authority in any way, shape, or form. Likewise, the independent judiciary remains a work in progress in Russia. There was no independent judiciary under the Soviet Union. So in 1993, the Constitution specifically did create a constitutional court. The court has 19 members, and it's supposed to make sure that laws passed by the Duma and proposed by the government are constitutional. However, up to now, this court has refused to even consider striking down any of Putin's favored laws or policies. Hence, we really don't have any idea right now how much or if these if this court is, you know, independent at all. We don't have any sense of that. The Constitutional Court created the Supreme Court, which is the last court of appeal in Russia, but the Supreme Court does not review the constitutionality of laws. Certainly, the Russian legal system still suffers from a lot of the old Soviet problems. Lawyers are poorly trained, there's no presumption of innocence, and efforts to try to get jury trials going as a consistent means of deciding cases have largely failed. And problematically, if I'm being honest, the courts have been often used as a tool of the government to punish its enemies, not a check on the other branches, decreasing its legitimacy even further. As you can expect then, as a result, the rule of law is not strong in Russia, even today. Corruption is a huge problem in Russia. In the old Soviet Union, the KGB State Security Committee could do whatever it wanted to whoever it wanted, whenever it wanted to. Hence, to be safe, you had to bribe them. And still today, bribery is everywhere in Russia. One Moscow research firm found that at least 50% of Russia's population is involved on corruption in a daily basis. This behavior ranges from simple bribes, like bribing an official to get a driver's license more quickly, to like big deals like bribing court officials for favorable court rulings. And one interesting aspect though, when I do talk about the rule of law that I always wanna point out is the Russian military. It's massive. Its army is about 4 million men. It's much, much larger than the United States. Yet from a practical standpoint, in recent years it's suffered a series of setbacks and some argue military humiliations, perhaps including right now in Ukraine. 
But what's really interesting about the Russian military is despite its size, the Russian military has not, at least since 1917, involved itself directly in the politics of the Russian state. You might expect to see a military that's so powerful as the Russian military is to take a more active role. You might expect to see coup d'etats, but you don't in Russia, indicating that power has been so successfully centralized within Moscow and within the Kremlin that it is just almost inconceivable to expect an outside force to be able to do anything about that. All right, finally, let's, let's talk about some current issues. Um, one is economics. Economically, the question remains, how much should the Russian state be privatized? How much should there be state control? This is an open question still. Um, sadly, the Russian economy has not done well during times of economic crisis. For example, during the 2008 crisis, the Russian stock market lost 70%, 70% of its value. That's unbelievable. And today, Russia's economy remains almost exclusively dependent on energy sales, particularly oil and gas. The problem is the war in Ukraine has tested the strength of even this considerable advantage. Russia does not have a large economy. It's a geographically huge country. Population-wise, it's a huge country. But you may be interested to know, Russia's economy, its GDP, it's about the same size as the state of Italy. Now, foreign policy, I'm really not going to talk about much here because it's hard to talk about this without talking about Ukraine, and I'm not going to address that at least not the most recent parts of the conflict. After the fall of the Soviet Union, Russia did found the Commonwealth of Independent States, which immediately it dominated. But things have changed more recently. The Russian army and Russian state has grown a little bit more aggressive. In 2008, Russia invaded Georgia in the Caucasus. And then in March of 2014, after Ukraine's government appeared poised to turn toward the West, Russian forces moved into the Crimea, a region of Ukraine in the Black Sea. Putin later formally annexed the region, and it remains a part of Russia today. But this aggressiveness has led states around Russia, including Ukraine, to turn ever more closely toward the West and the European Union in specific. Now, Russia, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, has tried to rebrand itself internationally, mostly to get access to financial resources and financial markets. It tried to join the G7, which it did um, successfully for a brief period and became the G8 for a time, but its membership was revoked in 2014 after the Crimea episode. It is um, still a member of the World Trade Organization. It took a long time to join that, but it did join in, in 2012 successfully after a lot of back and forth negotiations. But I think that, that that's gonna be a question moving forward as well. Overall, foreign policy for Russia remains very much a moving target and a mixed bag. The last thing I want to talk about is population. Um, Russia, like a lot of states, is experiencing economic hardship due to um, population issues. And a lot of this goes back to the Soviet era, by the way, because um, Russia was a relatively, and I mean relative to other states, poorer country um, in, during the Soviet era. The Russian birth rate has been low for a really, really long time. And this is going to result in a significant population drop in the coming decades, leading to the question of whether or not Russia is going to continue to be able to support its aging population and whether or not it can maintain something like a four million man army. Moscow has responded to this by encouraging Russians living abroad to return home. But to be honest with you, this hasn't really done anything. While the population changes, the Kremlin in Moscow has worked steadily to continue to re-centralize its power and authority. To some Russians, this is perfectly fine. We have to remember, many Russians do not share the same values as those in the West. They might not value life, liberty, and property like we do. Russians have long valued statism, the belief that a strong and overreaching government makes your life better. Have a strong government or die is a frequent saying in Russia. And for good reason. This, after all, is the ideology that allowed Russia to become a global superpower in the first place.